Hi. So in today's lecture, I'd like to talk to you about single electron transistors. So first, let's remind ourselves of what transistors are. This is covered in another lecture, but briefly, uh, something like a transistor or field effect transistor is a device which allows us to use one electrical signal to control another. And in fact, transistor is shortened from transfer resistor. So these transistors, they have three co uh, connections, which are known as the emitter base collector um, or as the gate, the source, and the drain, whichever one. And what you're doing is you're controlling the voltage on one wire, which is your gate or a base, and that controls the ease with which you can have current move between the other terminals, which are the source drain and the emitter collector. So the transistor is the um, device that's at the heart of all of our modern electronics. And so, of course, we want to shrink it down. So what is a bulk transistor like? Well, this is one kind of transistor. It's an in-channel junction field effect transistor. And what you do here is you form a channel uh, of n-type material in a substrate of p-type material. And then you have your three wires, as shown in this diagram, your source, your gate, and your drain. And then the gate controls the effective size of your channel that the um, charge carriers can, can travel through, okay? And that restricts um, your current or uh, makes your current larger, depending on how that voltage is applied to the gate, okay? So that's basically what's going on. And you can see our lecture on um, transistors, semiconductor devices to get more information about macro scale transistors, if you will. But if you want to talk about making transistors tiny, uh, stick with us here. What we're doing is we're making electronic components smaller. And what that also does is make the current a lot smaller, too. And what we're going to approach at the end of this lecture is talking about the single electron transistor, where you have the motion of just one electron. So these are some images of some tiny transistors that uh, folks in research groups across the world have made. Um, at top right, you have a scanning electron uh, microscope image acquired um, of the first wrap gate, first nanowire transistor featuring a wrap gate. And this was um, done in 2011 in Sweden and New South Wales. And then at bottom right, you have an electron microscopy image with a carbon nanotube transistor, and that was scaled to a 40 nanometer footprint. And this was carried out in IBM and published in 2015. And so you can see that the dimensions on these things are, are truly approaching mind-bogglingly small. You've got um, uh, dimensions here on the order of 10 or 11 nanometers, so that's teeny. So a single electron transistor, um, in this kind of transistor, the electron flows through a tunnel junction between the source and the drain. And the one that's talked about in your textbook, this one here, is a quantum dot type single electron transistor. And so you have your source drain in the middle of those. You have a quantum dot, which is a little conductive island. And um, yeah, so in that, you have usually a metal particle on a semiconducting substrate. Um, there's another kind of single electron transistor, and that one is the confinement in a narrow wire, but we're going to focus on the quantum dot today. And here's some images. Um, images at right are from Dr. Renberg's group at Dartmouth, and here they have a single electron transistor coupled to a silicon-silicon germanium uh, double quantum dot here, and the bottom is a superconducting single electron transistor fabricated above a quantum dot in a gallium arsenide heterostructure. Okay. So um, this is the link scale of the things that you're talking about there. This little scale bar down here is 100 nanometers. So we're approaching really, really tiny stuff with this. So what are the um, fundamental ideas of the single electron transistor? Well, um, this figure from your textbook um, in chapter 6 shows a, um, a schematic here of what's going on. So in the images in the uh, left-hand column, what you see are a cartoon. You have your source, and you have your drain, and then you have your quantum dot in the middle, and then there's your gate. Now, the top picture is with the gate voltage off, okay? So there's no voltage being applied. Now, what's happening is you've got, at your source, a bunch of electrons that would like to make it through, okay? But if there's the, no gate voltage, if the gate voltage is off, then it's not energetically advantageous for them to do so. On the top right here in the second column, 
this uh, column of uh, images is bar graphs of what the potential energy is like in the source, the dot, and the drain, okay? So here we have uh, electrons sitting in the source, but you can see that there's this potential energy barrier, this Coulomb blockade barrier that it has to overcome. We'll talk about what that energy is in just a second. Um, but you can see that the energy between the source and the dot is comparable, so their potential energies are comparable. Now in order for tunneling to be possible, the energy in the dot must be lower than the energy in the source. So how do you achieve that? Well, if you apply a voltage to your gate, okay, then that can change the energy levels here so that now your source, and now we're talking figure B here, the second from the top, the energy of the source is now higher than the potential energy inside the dot. See, now in this case, it is advantageous for those electrons to tunnel through this Coulomb blockade energy from the source to the dot. So that's, that's what'll happen if you give it enough time, okay? Now, in this third row here, we have an electron now sitting in the quantum dot. And you can see that the potential energy inside the dot has risen because of the presence of the electron, okay? So the energy inside the dot is now larger again because the electrons hopped over, and that's because it's a little tiny capacitor that's just been charged. More about that in a second. Okay, so now we have this electron sitting here in the dot, and it sees a lower energy in the drain. But to, do, to get there, it has to tunnel through this Coulomb blockade potential energy barrier right here. Okay, it eventually does that because there is a lower potential energy over there. It tunnels through that barrier to the drain, and then you've just had a little tiny current conductive from your source to your drain. Okay, and then once the dot's free, uh, it's free again for another electron to tunnel through from the source, and the process starts all over again. Okay, so there's lots of interesting physics at play here. Okay, what we've got here is between our source and our drain, this little quantum dot conductive island right here, okay? Now, I said that it was a little tiny capacitor, right? So, remember that isolated objects can have a capacitance associated with them. This is uh, covered in a lot of introductory physics courses and electricity and magnetism courses, so you don't necessarily need two conductors. So what we're going to assume is that our little quantum dot is a little sphere, okay, a little spherical particle. Now, it doesn't have to be a sphere. It changes the formula for the capacitance, but that's all, okay? So if you assume that the voltage difference is between the sphere's edge and infinity, if you assume V is equal to uh, infinity, then your voltage is KQ over R at the edge of the sphere, okay? Now, remember, K is your Coulomb constant which is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth in SI units. It's also equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, okay? Okay, so if you plug that in, your capacitance, uh, capacitance equation is equal to Q over delta V, where delta V is the potential difference. So if you plug in the voltage for an isolated sphere, then you've got Q over KQ over R. Q cancels out, and you end up with R over K, okay? Now, if it were in a vacuum, then this would be r uh, 4 pi epsilon not r. But if we're talking about it being inside of a material, then it goes from the permittivity of free space to the regular permittivity, epsilon. Um, and remember that epsilon is the dielectric constant kappa times epsilon naught. So you can look these up for different materials, what those constants are. So you can see here that we have the capacitance for our isolated sphere of radius r, and that capacitance would be 4 pi epsilon r. Now, if you have a, uh, a shape that's not a sphere, that's okay. All it does is change the number here out front. It's still going to be dependent upon the characteristic dimension, right, of your object and some constant numbers, okay? So remember that the capacitance is something that depends upon the geometry of the object, all right? Now, your quantum dot is a does have capacitance. It could be a little sphere, it could be a little disk, but anyway, it has a capacitance to it. So remember that your capacitors, and this is also from intro physics, are devices that store electric charge, okay? So the capacitance of your capacitor, C is equal to Q over delta V, um, and when your capacitor is charged, the potential energy of your capacitor can be expressed in any number of different ways here. 
we've got the potential energy is equal to Q squared over 2C, and using the capacitance equation, you can plug in and rearrange and have all these other different um, forms for it, 1 half Q delta V, 1 half C delta V squared. Anyway, the potential energy increases for the capacitor as the charge increases. That's exactly what's happening to the little quantum dot when the charge hops from the source to the dot, right? Remember that the potential energy of the dot went up because it's a little capacitor and now it's charged, okay? All right, now we talked about how quantum tunneling is used to move the charge from the source to the dot and from the dot to the drain, okay? So previously I forced you to watch a lecture on quantum tunneling, okay, so you understand about that. But you also should know that, you know, tunneling would occur, right? It would jump from here to there. But what we want is we want to be able to control the tunneling. We don't want it to just happen on its own, okay? We don't want it to happen willy-nilly. We want it to jump when we want it to jump, okay? We want to be able to control the tunneling, okay? Now, to do that, what we're going to do is pick a voltage carefully, make our geometry of our capacitor and our setup such that it won't jump until we want it to, and when we want it to, we'll apply the voltage, which makes it energetically favorable for it to jump, okay? Now, how do we know what that is, okay? First, we want it to take more than thermal energy to charge the capacitor. That's the Coulomb blockade, which is this uh, gray barrier here in between the source and the dot. That's the potential energy that we want to stand in the way of uncontrolled tunneling, crazy tunneling, okay? So we want this energy to be large enough so that it's a formidable enough barrier so that tunneling doesn't occur until we apply the voltage to the gate. All right, so in order to do that, we want our um, energy to be much, much greater, well, not much, much greater, but much greater than kT, where k here is Boltzmann's constant, k sub b is Boltzmann's constant, and t is the temperature in Kelvin, okay? So if your energy of your Coulomb blockade is larger than that, then it, tunneling won't just randomly occur. Okay, now how much is that? Well, going back to the charging equation for our capacitor, we've got q squared over 2c for our potential energy there. Okay, so if we want it to be a single electron phenomenon, then Q would be the charge of a single electron tunneling over, so that's E, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and then we would have that divided by 2 times the capacitance of our quantum dot, and there it is. Okay, so we want the potential energy for the charged capacitor to be a lot greater than KT, and that will be our Coulomb blockade. Okay? Now, the rule of thumb is that you want your uh, Coulomb blockade energy to be greater than 10 kT, okay? So that's a nice rule of thumb. Now, once you choose your Coulomb blockade energy, that means that you have now chosen the voltage that you have to apply to the gate to get tunneling to occur. Remember that there's a relationship in between a voltage and a potential energy, right? Uh, the charge times the voltage equals the potential energy. Okay, so if you want your voltage, you just take your Coulomb blockade energy E sub C and divide it by the charge E, and that gives you E over 2 times the capacitance of the dot. So that's the voltage that you must apply to the gate to control your tunneling. All right? Now, one other thing that you want to think about is the time constant. From introductory physics, you know that you have a, an RC circuit right? And uh, it takes a little time to get your RC circuit charged up and to discharge, right? Um, the time constant is equal to uh, the resistance times the capacitance. So for our little quantum dot, the time that it would take us to charge would be delta T is equal to R sub T times the capacitance of our dot, where R sub T is the resistance to the quantum tunneling. Now, if you plug that into your Heisenberg uncertainty principle, delta E delta T is approximately Planck constant, right? So the uncertainty in the charging energy, um, if you've got delta T as uh, uh, RT times C dot, then delta E would be approximately equal to Planck's constant divided by uh, RT C dot, okay? Now, your charging energies are already teeny-weeny very tiny, so it's very important that the uncertainty in the charging energy is less than the charging energy itself. Okay, so that's another thing that you have to think about 
when you're designing these single electron transistors. Otherwise, you're going to get hopping of electrons all over the place. You can't measure your charging energy very well. You can't control it. You want to be able to control it. Okay, I um, hope that helped, um, and I'll see you in class.